books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of these things which were written in the books according to their works. So dead or alive, if you don't make it into that thousand years, you're going to be judged according to your works. So if you're alive, right, you see Christ come and, you know, he doing everything he's doing and you're make you make it into the place of safety and you live your life right. At this moment, the only thing you can do now is depend on the judgment seat. Because if you don't make it into that thousand years, only thing you, you can rely on now is the judgment seat and doing what's right to, to get in by the book of life and law. Go ahead. This is Algie. Um, I mean, you know, if, um, if I'm saying something wrong, you let me know. No problem. You know, like always. But um, now, from being in the book of life, you're there when you're born. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and as far as um, your sin, the um, thing that gets you in trouble is unrepentance. Right. Um, when you continually sin and then you don't repent or you take it as a joke, mm -hmm. as you say you repent, but you continue to do it. You're hypocrite. Now that's when you're building up, you know, some bad stuff because it's an habitual thing. Right, right. If um, you say you sin, you know, you forgive me or whatever, and he forgives you, and then it's just like um, with the demons. Mm -hmm. When you do it again, it gets even worse. It gets it's worse. even harder for you to stop. Absolutely. So if you... um. You know, if you, um, what, what gets you out, erased, mm. is that continual thing. That continual you, thing. You, you, you continual, you know, just keep doing what you're doing and, and you don't repent. Right. Um, when, in the book, um, the, um, 12, um, Patriot. Yeah. And each one of them, the sins they committed. They repented, mm -hmm. and it was very difficult. It wasn't a simple thing to repent. Absolutely. But um, I guess you know. I guess I'm comparing repent, repenting to when you um when you um have a demon, mm -hmm. and the Most High heals you of that demon. Right. But then you go back and do what you do, and it brings seven more. Seven more. So it right. makes it even harder for you. Right. And then you end up in a life of continual. Right. Now, then you, then you, you can just try to skip it. Yes, yeah, that back, he, that backslide he, spirit. He yeah. always says to everybody, um, when he forgives someone, he says, and eh, sin no more. Right. Absolutely. So it doesn't mean that you're not going to sin again. Just don't do that. That thing that yeah. whatever he fixed. Mm -hmm. Don't do that anymore because if you do it, it comes back worse. Right, learn, learn. So that's, right. I was just, yeah. just a comment. Oh, yeah. If cool. I'm wrong, man. You no, you're right, though. Out, you know, you're right. So. I mean, all that is encompassed in, you know, baptism. Because baptism, when you first, you know, you you repenting for the things you know you've done wrong. Mm -hmm. But some people don't take baptism as serious as they should. Because baptism is an outward show to the most high. That you're ready to do the right thing, and I'm not going to do this anymore because that's the mind you have at that moment. But sin feels good to people. So sometimes people just get caught up in the the spirit of just sinning, and it causes them to backslide and call demons to come in. Go ahead. The, the baptism is like um, saying that now you're ready to commit because everybody grows at a different rate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we really supposedly have an understanding, then we realize what we're doing and how terrible it is. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's you know it's a really perfect thing when you see that when you finally realize that. And when you bat go get baptized, you're, you're supposedly saying, "I'm ready to give this life up, uh, this world. I'm ready right. to give this up and commit to this life." Right. So if you make a commitment, it's just like any commitment you make in life. For people who get married, you're committed to stay together throughout your life. Mm -hmm. But we see that doesn't really, a lot of times that doesn't happen. It don't happen. It just makes more problems in your life. <laughs> right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, she right. I saw another hand. I saw another hand. That was a flash of a hand. Well, you know what, it's all subject, so I'm writing it down so I can ask you that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go to um, Enoch again. Because again, we're still speaking on things that's taking place before, after, and during the thousand years. So in the book of Enoch, we're going to read about some of you know, our forefathers and things in which they spoke of during that time. So we're in Enoch chapter 8 through 
verses 1 through 8. This is a vision. 83 what? 83, chapter 83, verses 1 through 8. Okay, we're in the book of Enoch, chapter 83, verse 1 through 8. Verse 1. And now, my son Methuselah, I will show thee all my visions which I have seen, recounting them before thee. Two visions I saw before I took a wife, and the one was quite unlike the other. The first was when I was learning to write, the second before I took my mother, when I saw a terrible vision. And regarding them, I brought AC. Bro, AC. AC. Tell him go out there. Don't ask. Come on, man. Go out. Go out with that. We can hear you. Come on, bro. Go ahead, bro. Okay, we're still in the book of Enoch, chapter 83, verse 2. The two visions I saw before I took a wife, and the one was quite unlike the other. The first was when I was learning to write. The second before I took thy mother, when I saw a terrible vision. And regarding them, I prayed to the Most High. I had laid me down in the house of my grandfather, Mahalalel, when I saw in a vision how heaven collapsed and was borne off and fell, down, fell to earth. And when it fell to earth, I saw how the earth was swallowed up in a great abyss, and mountains were suspended on mountains, and hills sank down on the hills, and high trees were rent from their stems, and hurled down and sunk in the abyss. And whereupon a word fell into my mouth, and I lifted up my voice to cry aloud, and said, The earth is destroyed, and my grandfather Mahalal waked me, as I lay near him, and said unto me, Why doest thou cry so, my son? And why doest thou make such lamentation? And I recounted to him the whole vision which I had seen. And he said unto me, A terrible thing thou hast seen, my son, and of grave moment is thy dream vision as to the secrets of the sin of sin, oh, excuse me, as to the secrets of all the sin of the earth. It must sink into the abyss and be destroyed with a great destruction. Keep on verse eight. That was verse eight. And now, my son. And now, my son, arise and make petition to the Most High of Glory, since thou art a believer and a remnant, that a remnant may remain on the earth, and that he may not destroy the whole earth. So again, he's showing us here that in this vision he saw a remnant of us that was still here on this earth doing this destruction. And this remnant, he's telling us, this remnant may, may remain on the earth and that it may not be destroyed, it may not destroy the whole earth. So he gonna, that place of safety that we're always talking about is, is going to be in Jerusalem when Christ is ruling from that mountain. And this is the area that will not be destroyed. Why? Because it's going to be a remnant of us that's willing to follow the Most High, that's going to do everything that he tells us to do, and Christ is going to rule over us. And because of that, this place will be that place of safety, but everywhere else will be destroyed. But in this time, he, he's just showing you that. Ver, even verse 9, let's read verse 9. It says, my son from heaven, all this will come upon the earth, and upon the earth there will be great destruction. That destruction will destroy many kingdoms and many wicked people. But if we're on the right side of things, we'll, we'll be saved. We'll be in that place of safety, preserved until the full end. Question. No, I was. Because I was, I was trying to look up on the internet, but you know, of course, rent these days means to like pay for something. So, what does rent mean according to the Bible? Destru yeah, like destruction. Destruction, rent okay. to, tore apart, stuff like that. All right, cool. Thank yeah, you. no problem. So, if you understand, like we, we we was going through in this in this these parts that we went through, that sand of the sea, which is talking about, it's speaking of Israel, but it's also speaking of that remnant of nations that will, you know, serve the Most High. Now, I'm going to jump from there now 
Actually, let's go to second Baruch. Let me get this real quick. Second Baruch, 51, 1 through 5. Actually, we're going to go with the whole book section. Okay. 1, 1 through 16. Yeah, this one. Okay. This is second Baruch, chapter 51, verses 1 through 16. Then we're going to jump into, you know, other nations being left. Go ahead, bro. We're in the Suya Pergraphica. In the uh, second Baruch, chapter 51, verses 1 through 16. Verse 1. And it shall come to pass, when that appointed day is gone by, that then shall the aspect of those who are condemned afterward be afterward changed, and the glory of those who are justified. For the aspect of those who now act wickedly shall become worse than it is. And they shall suffer torments. So right there he's telling us that all those who, you know, are in a place of torments as of right now, they're going to be changed, as the scriptures say here. They're going to be changed and suffer worse torments. Read, read again. Verse 1. And it shall come to pass, when that appointed day has gone by, that then shall the aspect of those who are condemned be afterwards changed. So right there we can go all the way back to Revelation. 20 and 12 and it says and I saw the dead small the great stand before the most high and the books were open and another book was open which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of each those things which were written in books according to their works so here it's telling you that these same people they're going to be changed too so you go all the way back to 1 Corinthians 15 and it shows you that all shall not sleep but all shall be changed so even the dead shall be changed but the ones who remain, which we've been showing earlier, that's following the Most High, we're going to be changed too. But for an incorruptible or mortal body where we'll be living forever in spirit with Christ and the Most High. But the dead shall be forever tormented. In order for this to happen, they have to receive a change too. So that's what 1 Corinthians 15 is telling us. But now the root is giving us more understanding of that change. Go ahead, bro. For the aspect of those who now act wickedly shall become worse than it is, and they shall suffer torments. Also, as for the glory of those who have now been justified in my law, who have had understanding in their life, and who have planted in their hearts the root of wisdom, then their splendor shall be glorified in changes. See, they're going to be changed as well. Everyone who's been following the word of the Most High is going to be changed as well. But for the better or for the good, the wicked for the wicked, things they've done for the worse, and the things of the, the righteous for the good. Keep on, bro. And the form of their face shall be turned into the light of their beauty, that they may be able to acquire and receive the world which does not die, which is, which is then promised to them for above. For over this above all shall those who come then lament that they rejected my law and stopped their ears so that they might not hear. So, so that means everyone who's getting changed from the place of torments or that didn't follow the Most High, they're going to see the righteous getting their righteous bodies being changed. Now their faces will take on the form of the spirit that's in them, their hearts. If you got a righteous heart, mind, and spirit, that's what you're going to be changed into. That inner man that we always talk about, that you have to work on the inner man because this right here means nothing. But that inner man is what matters. So the scripture is telling us that's what we're going to be changed into. If you're a loving person, always showing positivity, always giving people good comments and just loving people, loving the most high, doing everything, that's what you're going to be changed into. No God will be found in you. But all those who, who didn't want to choose the right path will see that taking place and be envious because they're going to say, man, I should have did right. I should have did this, but too late. Be reading, bro. Verse 4. For over this above all shall, all shall those who come then lament that they rejected my law and stopped their ears that they might not hear wisdom or receive understanding. When therefore they see those over whom shall they are now exalted, but who shall be exalted and glorified more than they, they shall respectively be transformed. 
the latter into the splendor of angels, and the former shall yet more waste away in wonder at the visions and in the beholding of the forms. For they shall first behold and afterwards depart to be tormented. So we all going to be changed into the form of angels, that spirit. It's a spirit world that's being developed. Christ has gone and set that world up for us. So we all will be changed into that spirit being. So it's either going to be for the good or for the bad. So if you've been doing wickedly, you're still going to be changed into that spirit world because now hell and death will be tossed in that lake of fire. So the only way you can survive in that lake continuously forever is you have to have a change. And that change is that form of being changed into a spirit or an angel, as the scriptures say. You got Sister Stephanie? Can you give me a short answer for what's the difference between hell and the lake of fire? Well, hell is a holding place. Hell, when you say hell, we're speaking of a place of torments. Hell is that place where you get tormented, but it's like being in jail. You're not getting the worst of it till they send you to the pen pen. Like right now, okay, let's use county and let's use, I ain't gonna say federal, but federal chill. Let's say the maximum security prison. Maximum security prison, you got all your murderers, rapists, um, you know, pedophiles, all that type of stuff mixed all into one. Drug dealers, everything. Not a drug dealers most of the time, unless they violent crime drug dealers, they in federal. But the maximum security, your serial killers, your, you know, your crazy folks. So that means your guards got to be just as crazy as them or crazier. So you in a place with maximum security prison just getting destroyed. That's the lake of fire. Say that again? That's the lake of fire. That's the lake of fire. See, jail, you getting prepared to go somewhere. They say your sentence, right? You got to go to your little court dates and all that other stuff like that. The bailiff, not the bailiffs, but the, the, you know, the little sheriffs that's there, you know, they hit you with a stick every once in a while, poke in your side, you know, tell you, oh, you, you ain't nothing. You know, they just preparing you for what's to come. But now you dealing with the people that's in there. You dealing with the, 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 Rulers that's down there, because it's going to be rulers in that dark area, destroying you, basically just tormenting you to death, like your prisoners, the, the hard prisoners, like your hard, uh, um, what you call them, CO, correctional officers. Are you still speaking of? Um, hell and uh, torments, yeah. Not, not the, um, well, hell and uh, the lake of fire. Yeah. Oh. The lake of fire is going to be worse. Like, basically what I'm saying, it's going to be worse than, than hell. Hell is a place where they, it's a holding place. It's a holding cell. You're being tormented, but not to the extreme as we just read. It's going to be worse than the original torment. Read that again. I think it was in verse, uh, verse 1. And it shall come to pass when that appointed day is gone by that then shall the aspect of those who are condemned to be afterwards changed and the glory of those who are justified. For the aspect of those who now act wickedly shall become worse than it is. They shall suffer torments. And as for the glory of those who have been justified. Right. So you see what the scripture is telling you? It's going to be worse than what they're already going through. So the torments they're experiencing now might just be bugs and... Like, like taking a match and burning your fire as opposed to your whole body being on fire. And never going out. Always just burn, but not just fire. It's, it's, it's things we've read through scriptures that tell you that we're going to be dealing with elements. We're going to be dealing with bugs. We're going to be dealing with all types of torments that you ain't never seen before. So a lot of people get caught up on just the fire. But the scripture has showed us that it's going to be way more than just fire. That fire is going to be unquenchable. And yes, you're going to be constantly burning. But imagine burning, feeling it like imagine being in your mind you are in right now. And still having your same senses that you have right now. And it never stops. Never changes. Your mind is still the same mind you had when somebody came up to you and said, hey, you should keep the Sabbath. And you said to them, Sunday is Sabbath. You're going to have that same mind. So that same mind means you're going to have the same senses that you had as that human. So what's the only thing that's happening now is you're receiving a spiritual change physically, which is spiritual. That change is what's going to be going to be destroying your mind. It's going to be destroying you as a person. Because now you're dealing with stuff you ain't never dealt with in your life. Torments, 
worse than you ever did with, ever. Sister Aaron? Oh, I was just asking, so when they, well, whoever makes it, makes it to that stage, mm -hmm. um, when they get there, they're going to still have their mind, like, knowing who their family was and stuff? Like everything. Everything, every, everything that they've ever done in their life, they're going to be like the scripture just told us. They're going to see the ones who get in the righteous change and be jealous and mad and because they didn't do what these people told them. You see what I'm saying? Like, they, somebody came to them and let them know, hey, like I told you, you should keep the Sabbath. Oh, Sunday's good. They're going to remember that day. Most of them are going to remind them of it. When you stand before him and the laws is going to be written out, he probably going to take every law. He was like, you sinned against this law. You might say to yourself, now when when I do that, I was keeping, you know, I was keeping uh, the Sabbath day Sunday. He was like, nah, nah. Remember when this guy came to you and told you? That was me trying to warn you and give you some level of understanding. You didn't want to accept it. You wanted to go by what man was saying. Strike. That's one strike against you. Every single thing. Bro, AC. Which verse? Verse 37. Okay. It says, And I saw another multitude of uh, pits in the same place. In the midst thereof, a river filled with a multitude of men and women, and worms devoured them. But I, I wept and sighed and asked the angel, Lord, who are these? And he said unto me, These are they that exhort usury on usury and trusted in their riches not having hope in the most high that he was their helper. So, I mean, this this going to the same thing we're talking about. But these are some of the torments that we're going to be going through. In your right mind. That's the bad part. That's why it's so bad, because you're going to be still in the same mind state that you were right now. Being tormented with a body that filled everything, but it's never destroyed. This is what this is letting you know. This is what Baruch is telling you. You're going to be in the same mind, but you're going to receive a change like everybody else. That change is going to be for the better or the worse. You don't want to be on the side of the worse. Because that's where it's going to get really, really terrible. Forever. Not, you know, understand when I say forever. We're going to be living with the Most High in Christ forever. Never no more God, guile, destruction going to be thrown in the pit. War, death, everything thrown in there with you. And if you are operating in that same pit, that mind state that you're going to have, seeing everything that you, one, was afraid, because most people who are afraid of death are usually not afraid of the most high. Period. Why I say that? Because we get so caught up in dying and not wanting to die because we want to live in this world and continue to, you know, have all the things that we want continue to, you know, do the things that we want to do, not according to the word. So we're scared, we're scared of death because we know it's a place after death that you're going to go. Thomas or the place of uh, the bosom of Abraham. So we are, we are afraid, but if we actually fear the most high, we wouldn't fear anything. Death, anything. Why? Because most high can do exactly what we're showing you he can do right now. He can raise you from the dead as he's saying here in Revelation 20. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before the Most High. Who did that? The Most High. He raised you from the dead just to judge you, change you, and spit you into the, the, the lake of fire. To burn and torment and have worse torment than you had originally. That's who we should be fearing. So if you fear him, you ain't worried about this, this, this death here. You're not worried about death at all. Why? Because you're trying to live a righteous life. And you know if I strive to do what's right, I got a place in the kingdom of God. That's how we all got to think. That's that confidence that I'm always talking about. In praying and asking the most high for anything and walking around. That's that confidence that you got to have. Because when you got that confidence of knowing that you're trying to do everything right, even the smallest little mistake that you make won't be seen so hard on you. Because you're striving for perfection, as the scripture tells us. We should all be striving for perfection. So when, when, when you got that mind in you, well, I ain't scared of death. You know, if I die, I die. Especially if you walk in right. You die, you die. You know you're either going to go, like, it, it's not like you go to some of these funerals now, and people guessing where a person is going. Oh, he, he going to heaven. Oh, he going to heaven. Because mind you now, 
These preachers now, they ain't holding back no stops. They call your life out as it they see. So they looking at brothers getting killed from gun violence in the street, and they straight telling you off the top, oh, he going to hell. But Sister Judy sitting in the church, and I don't mean to use somebody name here, but Sister, uh, I'm trying to just change the name. Sister uh, LaQuisha, now nah, that's somebody name too. Sister, uh, I don't want to use no good names. Just Sister, Sister, sit, yeah, Sister sitting in the church. Sitting in the, in the church on Sunday every day, following Easter, following Christmas, doing all these things she thinks she's doing right. She not knowing, you know, that she's doing wrong. Somebody didn't try to tell her, but she ain't hearing it. So now she got to go through the same thing all the wicked folk going through. Because she didn't want to listen. She didn't want to put that, put that stuff down and just follow what the most I told us to do. Good. But part of, part of your walk was being humble, too. Absolutely. Which means that you know, you know within yourself that each day you probably sin. True. Each day, every day. But before you close your eyes at night, you ask him to forgive you Absolutely. for any sins that you may have committed against him. Absolutely. So you constantly do that so you can have that confidence he's talking about. That you're not walking around thinking you're perfect. You know you're not. And you know you're messing up. And you're, you're constantly saying, you know, I know I messed up. Fix me. Help me to do yeah, better. fix me. Creating me a clean heart. That's one of the top scriptures in here. Mm -hmm. Creating me a clean heart. That's why I tell you that inner man, as this scripture just told you, the change is going to be into whatever that inner man is. Mm -hmm. Even in wickedness, you're going to be changed to that inner man. That mind that you have is that wicked man, that's where you're going to be. But the righteous man, that mind that he has, is what he's going to be changed to as we just read. So anybody that want to want to operate righteously. That's why I always tell you, put the mirror in your face. Start there. When you put that mirror in your face and start seeing the things you're doing wrong, you won't be able to walk up to everybody else. Oh, you this, you this, you that. You won't be able to point nobody else out because your sins, excuse me, if you striving to be perfect, you so busy worrying about your sins and matching them up righteously, you can't worry about nobody else. You got to stand before the judgment seat just like I do. You see what I'm saying? Or I'm making it to the thousand, one or the other. But either way it go, you got to strive for something. And perfection is what we're striving for. So the first thing, the first thing we need to be dealing with is inner man. This showing you even more. So here, when you read the scripture, it tells you you're gonna be changed into that inner man. Read that again. I think the first one. No, the righteous. I think it was coming after that. Um. Okay. Glory to verse two. Also, as for the glory of this, Second Baruch chapter 51, verse 3. Also, as for the glory of those who have now been justified in my law, who have had understanding in their life, and who have planted in their heart the root of wisdom, then their splendor shall be glorified in changes, and the form of their face shall be turned into the light of their beauty that they may be able to acquire and receive the world which does not die, which is then promised to them. So right there he's telling you that beauty that he's talking about, he ain't talking about your face, this vain glory. He's telling you this all passed away. We all get old. You know, if you think you hot now, look at some of these movie stars and TV stars that you see. They so busy trying to do plastic surgery to keep up with who they was way back in the whenever day. All that stuff fades away. But the beauty he talking about is that inner man. That's why a lot of times you see guys dealing with girls or girls dealing with guys. They say, man, why he with her? Or why she with him? We don't see nothing but the physical. They may see that inner man. That inner man is what is attracting them. That inner woman is what is attracting them. That's what the most high is attracted to us on. Our inner being. Because our inner being is what's, what we're going to be changed into. And the scripture just told us that. So if you got a righteous inner person and you're doing everything, like, this, like scripture said, the law, the splendor, um, have planted in their hearts the root of wisdom, then their splendor shall be uh, glorified and changes. That's what he's looking for, that we put in this word in us. That's why scriptures like study to show thyself approved unto the most high are so important. See, we get caught up all the time in, in you know, 
the law and different things of the law, like, you know, fringes, things like, some people get caught up in that stuff. Some people get caught up in certain feast days and how to do it and all this and the third. He ain't looking at all that carnal stuff. He looking at your spirit, man, that inner man. Are you honestly trying to do this righteously for the right reasons or are you trying to do it to say you did something? And that's what a lot of people get caught up in, doing things and say, oh, I did this. Oh, you know, we had the Feast of Tabernacles. I was this, I was that. You ain't really in the right spirit of the Feast of Tabernacles. Because the Feast of Tabernacles, one, if we actually look at it, even if we're going through this lesson that we're dealing with now, what's the feast that the Most High said every nation during that thousand-year reign has to come up to him? Matter of fact, let's get that real quick. Mm -hmm. the feast of Tabernacles is that feast. Mm -hmm. Um, that's saying Zechariah chapter 8. 8 and 1. Zechariah chapter 8 and 1. Because it's, it's important. Little things like that we don't pay attention to because we're so busy trying to, you know, get caught up in, you know, the positioning and trying to get caught up in the you know, the hoopla of who who's a, you know, a hood superstar, that kind of stuff. That's how I look at it. You know, people people want to be in the midst of who 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 the cool crowd is. And we ain't realizing that sometimes them cool crowds leading us right down the wrong road. And we don't understand how important, like, things like the Feast of Tabernacle. Why is it so important? One, the Feast of Tabernacle should have shown everybody where they at, spiritually and, and mentally. Because being out there in the wilderness, you ain't got time to be worried about what everybody else doing. You ain't got time. You, why? Because you got, one, you might have your household you got to take care of. So that means if you don't work, you don't eat. That means you got to get on the move. One. Two, if you don't protect your house and make sure you're building the right things around your house, what's going to happen? The wolves going to come in. Things going to come and destroy. So you got to be paying attention. Then the main thing is, in the wilderness, we got 100% rely on the most high. We talk about, oh, we had these storms, we had this, we had that. Granted, it's danger in storms, but it's even safer. Think of Peter. We went over the lesson Saturday. Think of Peter. Think of them being out on the water, going through the storms. and They see Christ chilling, walking on water like it's nothing. Where is your faith at? Everybody in the Feast of Tabernacles, we got to have a level of faith knowing you know, and connected. That's where that confidence come in. If we in the midst of a storm, understand, he ain't gonna let nothing happen to you if you actually operating in the truth of his word. If you truly being or operating according to his word, he gonna protect you through all these things we going through. So that's what Tabernacles is a, one of those feasts that you can't take this feast and just boast like I did this, I did that. That's one of the feasts that's supposed to show you you. Period. Each individual person. What can I contribute to this body? That's what we should have been looking at and seeing in the feast.